Back in my college and youth pastoring days, I can remember singing the song, Who may ascend the hill of the Lord, Who may be found in your holy place, Only those who are clean and pure in their hearts, Make it to where you are. So do what you will, do what you want, we have decided to trust you only. We want to be whatever you're wanting. You are the Lord of our lives. That little song, that little praise chorus comes from Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, and who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood, and has not sworn deceitfully. He shall receive a blessing from the Lord, and a righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, even Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates. Be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Several days ago, Pastor Christian uh, shared a wonderful devotion from Psalm 15, and he noted that some people believe Psalm 15 and Psalm 24 are connected. Now, neither of these psalms are, provide us with the historical situation in which they were penned, but some suggest that these were written for the occasion of the bringing of the Ark of the Covenant up to Mount Zion. Whether or not this was the case, at bare minimum, the driving focus of these psalms appears to be one's fitness or qualification to come into the Lord's presence, to dwell in his house, to ascend the hill, and to stand in his holy place. Uh, Pastor Christian, when talking about this, I do encourage you to go listen to his uh, message from Psalm 15, because in that he traces a little bit of that, uh, the occasions around that bringing of the ark and the the Philistines having put it on an ox cart and the Israelites uh, sinfully, wrongfully, just following their lead and putting it on a new ox cart rather than carrying it on poles and Uzzah reaching out and touching the ark and um, being struck dead um, for his presumption. This question of who is the one who can enter into the Lord's presence? It's, it's an important question, one of incredible importance. Psalm 15, 1 asks it, O Lord, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell on your holy hill? Here Psalm 24 and verse 3 says, Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The answer provided is that it is those who, enter God, who can enter God's presence and dwell with him are only those who walk with integrity, who work righteously, who speak truth, who show kindness, who uphold justice, who love mercy, who have clean hands, and pure hearts, which to be honest, is a bit of a scary answer, isn't it? Who is all of that? And even if you or I have had moments of that being evident, none of us can say we have a perfect track record in any of those things. So how can such a standard be real? Why would we sing about this impossible thing? And who can make such a demand upon us? Who has the authority to make this kind of command, this demand. So we ought not be surprised that this requirement, spoken of in verses 3 and 4, is preceded and followed by the description of the one into whose presence we are desiring entrance. In verses 1 and 2, we see the ultimate king described to us. Spurgeon said it this way, The whole round world is claimed for Jehovah. God is not the God of the Jews only, but of the Gentiles also. If a man be but a man, the Lord claims him. Jesus Christ has made an end of the exclusiveness of nationalities. Man lives upon the earth and parcels out its soil among his mimic kings and autocrats. But the earth is not man's. He is but a tenant at will, 
a leaseholder upon the most precarious tenure, liable to instantaneous ejectment. The great landowner and true proprietor holds his court above the clouds and laughs at the title deeds of worms of the dust. Jehovah is the universal king. All nations are beneath his sway. True autocrat of all the nations, emperors and czars are but his slaves. Men are not their own, nor may they call their lips, their hearts, or their substance their own. They are Jehovah's rightful servants. In the second verse, we have the reason why the Lord can make these claims and say these things, namely because he's the creator and his title is beyond dispute. Spurgeon said, the world is Jehovah's because from generation to generation he preserves and upholds it, having settled its foundations. Providence and creation are the two legal seals upon the title deeds of the great owner of all things. He who built the house and bears up its foundations has surely a first claim upon it. So the ultimate king is sovereign. God created all, God upholds all, therefore God owns all. And if we are his creatures and we seek an audience from him, we have to be holy as he is holy. And therein lies the rub. The ultimate king makes a demand which produces the ultimate dilemma. Spurgeon asks, who is he that can gaze upon the Holy One and can abide in the blaze of his glory? Certainly none may venture to commune with God upon the footing of the law. In other words, Spurgeon is saying there's no way that we are the ultimate law keepers. We can't come into his presence as actually being that when we're not. He goes on, The question before us is one which all should ask for themselves, and none should be at ease till they've received an answer of peace. Clean hands would not suffice unless they were connected with a pure heart. True religion is heart work. We, have, we may wash the outside of the cup and the platter as long as we please, but if inward parts are filthy, we're filthy altogether in the sight of God. For our hearts are more truly ourselves than our hands are. In other words, we can lose a hand and still live, but we cannot lose our hearts and still live. The very life of our being is in our inner nature, and hence the imperative need for purity within, not only clean hands without. There must be a work of grace in the core of the heart as well as in the palm of the hand, or our religion is a delusion. This present verse shows that, uh, shows that in the saints, grace reigns and grace alone. They do not ascend the hill of the Lord as givers, but as receivers. They don't wear their own merits, but a righteousness which they have received. God first gives us good works and then rewards us for them. Grace is not here obscured, Spurgeon comments, by the demand of holiness, but is highly exalted as we see it decking the saint with jewels and clothing him in uh, fair white linen, all the sumptuous array being a free gift of mercy. God's people are able to come with clean hands and pure hearts because of the finished work of Jesus Christ on their behalf. And then the Spirit who indwells us empowers us to live according to God's commands such that we do uphold justice and we do show kindness and we do extend mercy to others. In other words, we evidence the work of grace that's happened on the inside of us is an evidence on the outside. A pure heart given to us by the Holy Spirit through the work of regeneration is an evidence by clean hands that we're able to offer unto the Lord. Spurgeon said, Dear Reader, it is possible that you are saying, I shall never enter into the heaven of God, for I have neither clean hands nor a pure heart. Look then to Christ, who has already climbed the holy hill. He has entered as the forerunner for all those who trust in him. Follow in his footsteps and repose upon his merit. He rides triumphantly into heaven, and you shall ride there too if you trust in him. You see, recognizing that we don't have clean hands nor a pure heart, should drive your focus away from yourself and unto Jesus, the forerunner who has done what we have not. How can I get this character that's described? The Spirit of God is the one that must give this to us. He must create in us a new heart with a right spirit. And this only happens by trusting in Jesus Christ, in his paid penalty upon the cross whereby our sins can be forgiven, and his righteousness credited to our account. Through faith, we can be given a clean, 
a pure heart and clean hands. So realizing this righteousness is then the result from all of this, look at verses 7 through 10, it's the result of knowing and being rightly related to the ultimate Savior. Spurgeon said, These last words reveal to us the great representative man, to, uh, re- representative man who answered to the full character laid down, and therefore by his own right ascended the holy hill of Zion. Our Lord Jesus Christ could ascend into the hill of the Lord because his hands were clean and his heart was pure. And if we by faith in him are conformed to his image, we shall enter too. Who is he in person, nature, character, office, and work? What is his pedigree? What is his rank? The answer is given to us here at the end of of Psalm 24. Who is this king of glory? Who is this King of Glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. We know the might of Jesus by the battles which he has fought, the victories which he has won over sin and death and hell. And we celebrate how he has been victorious where we have failed. Spurgeon says, Oh, for a heart to sing his praises. Mighty hero, be thou crowned forever, King of kings and Lord of lords. And the closing note is an inexpressibly glad Grand, the the Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory. Jehovah of hosts, Lord of men and angels, Lord of the universe, Lord of the worlds. He is the King of glory. All true glory is concentrated upon the true God. For all other glory is a passing pageant, Spurgeon said. The painted pomp of an hour. The ascended Savior is here declared to be the head and crown of the universe. He is the King of glory, the Lord Jesus Christ.